Welcome to John Mannix on Anderson's TV. I'm with Simon Murray today. So Hello. we're going to be talking about Sakai drums, but before we do that, we're going to talk about you. Because that's more exciting, apparently. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> so, before I met you, my colleague who has played with you mm -hmm. introduced me to you who, who as... Would that, who would that be? Uh, someone that's, <laughs> someone's going to get deported soon, I don't know. Um, <laughs> He introduced me to you as yeah. Mr. 80s. So Mr. 80s. Why. Uh, <laughs> long story. Um, basically, uh, about 10 years ago, there was a, a thing called Here and Now. It's still going, actually. And basically, they got a load of 80s artists together and put on a big gig, and they used a house band. And I was in the house band. So a lot of these acts had not worked for a long time. Uh, and then from that, they sort of went out and did their own gigs and then I sort of got a call to do to play with a lot of these artists So I ended up sort of being the drummer for that artist um, So and you've uh, just finished a tour. I have just with, finished a tour with, one of with, them. with, on. with uh, Rick Astley yes. Who I've been with for about five years now who uh, is a wonderful wonderful man um, and he's had a bit of um, success uh, Recent success with the number one album last year. So uh, when we've been touring that for the last year basically and it's been great He's a lovely, lovely man. Yeah. Um, but you've literally flown back, was it last week? You in, what, Brussels and then Germany? Uh, and yeah. Cologne? Yeah, we did a European tour. Well, this year we've done, we've done about 60 gigs this year. We did America in January, February. Then we did a UK tour in March and April. Then we just did about three weeks in Europe, finishing in Copenhagen. Which is really cheap. It's just very cheap. <laughs> very cheap people, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> So, what are the what are the cool gigs we've done? You obviously uh, so, well. My dad is was a musician. He still is actually. He's eighty three, but he's not, he doesn't play play much now. But um, he got me involved with a singer called Gene Pitney, who's like an American singer who's sadly not with us anymore. But I did that gig when I was about eighteen, um, and I sort of that was yeah early 90s so i started doing that sort of show it was more sort of theaters and um and it was like reading dots and um and i sort of got into it that way really i mean i started off doing like working men's clubs with my dad when i was like 14 15 got myself in a band you know and uh yeah kind of um snowball from there really and then i ended up uh, moving to london like Dick Whittington to find fame and <laughs> <or> fortune. <laughs> uh, what was the gig you did this weekend? Obviously, you said that name to me, and I was like, "Wow, that seemed pretty cool." But you said it was no rehearsal; just literally went straight on the gig. Uh, with Go West, yeah, I did Go West last Saturday. I, I have played with them quite a few times, but I hadn't I hadn't done a gig with them for about seven or eight months. So it was literally get on stage, no sound check, and away you go. Um, so it was a little bit hairy, but it was good. I quite like that pressure. It's uh, it's interesting, and their stuff is not really something you can sort of blag, really, even though <laughs> it probably sounded like it. <laughs> no, no, they're, 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 they're great guys, and um, I really enjoy playing their music, and um, I think I did a good job. Well, I hope so. I'm doing a gig with them next week, so. <laughs> <laughs> you seem very casual about it. For the gigs that you do, because they're so big, mm. I'm assuming if you're going between one to the other, there isn't really always rehearsal time no i think rehearsals you know you don't really get uh, especially coming in especially depping i do a lot of depping so i'm always sort of you know someone give can we can you do a gig for me next saturday and uh, okay is a rehearsal no of course there isn't you know and it's uh, you just sort of get sent a, maybe some charts or they know send you the, a lot of recent live gigs so i end up sort of spending a couple of days just living and breathing that music for a couple of you know and just and just getting it in my head and then you know clocking the tempos and all that sort of thing and being prepared um, Are yeah, you someone you that sort of gets the chart, works off the metronome? I mean, some people listen in the car, in the shower, whatever. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I just sort of listen to absorb yourself. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes charts aren't, if, you know, sometimes you can get someone who's written out proper charts, you know, through Sibelius or whatever. But I think sometimes that can, you, you can rely too much on the chart. And, you know, I'd, I'd much rather sort of just have s s sort of idiot charts where you can just go, just sort of glance at them. But if you're actually sitting there reading a chart, sometimes I think it doesn't really help because you can just get lost in the chart and not with what's going on around you. So, But you yeah. have done West End stuff before as well. I have, yeah, you, yeah. The chart is everything. Yeah, of course, yeah. But again, with West End stuff, you kind of have to know it inside out before you go in and do it. You know, you can't, again, you can, some guys can just go in and sight read it. I mean, you know, but it's you, st you still have to know that stuff, and, and and it's a different thing when you're from when you're looking, you know, looking at it in your bedroom, to when you're actually sitting behind someone else's drum kit 
on a West End show and the lights go down and then you're off. It's 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 scary. But you know, it's um, I think reading is quite important. Uh, it was for me initially. You know, I think uh, you understand music a lot a lot more if you can if you can read music. Um, and I don't know, not so much now. I don't think in a lot of the pop gigs I do, there's not you don't really have charts, or you can do your own charts. But I don't. It, it's not like you know I do a lot of reading now. Um, but you also from the background you have, you, you used to teach and things anyway. So yeah, reading obviously. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, I mean, my dad always said to me, you've got to read music, and I did it, he, he got me reading music when I was about 10 or 11, before I found Women and Lager, so, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably the, the right age to do it, <laughs> so, you know, when you get to about 18, it's like, oh, you know, um, but um, no, it, it's, def it's definitely helped, you know, and, and certainly to go in and do sort of the West End stuff, you know, that the first thing they kind of ask you is, is can you read, and, you know, it's, um, it's definitely helped me. What would you say, obviously you've done a lot of pop stuff, what would you say was your coolest gig or favourite artist to work for? Or? Oh, I don't, I'd, I'd probably have to say Rick, actually. I've just been working with Rick Astley. He, he's just he's the nicest guy I've ever worked with. Um, and there's no, there's no ego with him because he's kind of been there and done it. He did it back in the 80s and the early 90s. And so, he, and, and, he's, and, he's, and, he's, and he retired for quite a while and then he's come back and had a, another... But, you know a lot of success again and it's not it's not it's not affecting him he's not you know he's not big time or anything you know it's just and it's nice nice group of people you know but it sounds like he's quite casual because he'll ring you up and talk about the tiles in your bathroom yeah he does that's, <laughs> that's pretty casual yeah yeah it is very casual uh, he also plays drums he's a very good drummer actually he was a because he, he started off playing drums when he was uh, a teenager and, and I think that's half your stick bag is full of his sticks stick not bag yours. is full of Rick's sticks yeah uh, sorry Rick I've still got those uh, so uh, but he's uh, he's actually a, he's actually a good drummer I think he was discovered uh, by Pete Waterman he was playing drums and singing so that's how he was first uh, discovered back in the 80s yeah okay I didn't know that yeah. There we go. Doing, doing an Eagles tribute or something. I'm not sure what he was doing. He was in a, I think he was in a, a 60s band or something or whatever. But he was, um, yeah, but he gets up. And when we do the gig, he gets up and, and plays, um, high, plays and sings Highway to Hell, which is quite interesting. And gives me a, a toilet break. So, <laughs> yeah. Just got time to chill out and yeah. book the next gig. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so apart from your dad, you got you started. Mm -hmm. who, who got you really passionate about drums? Well, there was a drummer my dad worked with, a guy called Alan Savage, and he, uh, I used to sort of, because uh, I started off playing keyboards when I was about seven or eight, and I didn't really like it, but because my dad was a keyboard player, I sort of thought I had to keep it up. But I just kept looking at drummers all the time, and I was on a, my dad was on a gig, and so my dad's drummer at the time was that guy, Alan Savage, and he sort of taught me, um, and I did about, probably about four years with him, you know, sort of like weekends and stuff, going around and... And then he got me into like Buddy Rich. Uh, and then as I got older, when I probably got to like 15, 16, I started listening to people like, am I even, it's like people like Neil Conti from Prefab Sprout. I was massively into him and I'd like listen to every single record that he played on. Um, and then there was another guy called Chris Whitten, who, uh, he was a session drummer. He played with Swing Out Sister and uh, Die Straits. Uh, he played drums on Hold of the Moon, you know that track? That's yeah. him, that's him. Um, so I used to sort of copy all his feels and probably still do them now. <laughs> uh, yeah, people like that really. Um, but Buddy Rich was, because only because my, my, my drum teacher got me into him and I had this Buddy Rich snare drum rudiments. I think you can probably still get it. Um, so, and then, and this is obviously like pre-YouTube or anything like that. So yeah, anything, you had VHS tapes of him and stuff like that. So. You know, um, but yeah. It sort of doesn't matter how, how old you are, what generation, most people, one or two generations old, mm. their teacher or their pupil or whatever, all yeah. love Buddy. Cause yeah, just, no, yeah, it's sort of it is. Yeah. Everyone. Well, yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. That, and the thing is, and the thing is, I never, you know, I'm not really into that. Although I have done a, a few jazz things um, and, and I was in a jazz trio when I was about 17, which, which, which sort of, you know, it was good, really good, really good for me, my playing as well, because I was doing a lot of brush work and things like that. But I, I was never really into the big band stuff and all that. But do, and when you watch Betty Rich play, it's just like, wow. I mean, that's just a different level of, you know, talent and um, stuff. But yeah, yeah, he was that. That he he was sort of the, the guy, you know. I think he was. He would, I think he, he died in '87, didn't he? 
Cause yes, because I remember, I was, yeah, I remember I was having lessons. He was 30, well, 30 years ago then, isn't it? Yeah. This year is, is his 100th anniversary of his like, birth because right, okay. there's a 100th anniversary stick. So. Oh, okay. They just did a gig, didn't they? They did a Ronnie Scott's thing recently, I saw. Yeah, and they also do like um, the memorial thing like they did was... That was 87, wasn't it? And then they did one in 96 or something? Yeah, I remember that one on video with um, Greg Wisnett and Steve Gadd and yes, Neil please. Pert. Yeah, Neil Pert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's probably on YouTube. Check that one out. Yeah. It's, it's a good watch. Yeah. Um, uh, musically then, what if, if you play keys and do a little bit of producing things, mm. what, who inspires you now? Is it the artists you work with or certain pop tunes you hear or Pete in a corner? I mean, it could be anyone. It's, no, it's not Pete. Of course not. Um, <laughs> he inspires me to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> well, he made that one for you, so oh, yeah. your place in drum oh, yeah. videos. Yeah, cheers, Pete. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, he's there. <laughs> uh, I don't know, really. I mean, I don't really... I listen to a lot of like, I mean, I, I love Taylor Hawkins. If you talk about sort of new, new sort of drummers, sort of, I mean, he's not even that new, is he now really? But, but you know, um, uh, I, I recently, I've just got, you know, when you get back into a band that you used to listen to, I, I, I was on holiday and I read um, Mick Fleetwood's uh, autobiography about Fleetwood Mac. And, and then I started listening to Fleetwood Mac stuff again. And I, and I wasn't never really massively into them. But when you actually listen to it now, it's, it's, you, you sort of get it. And, it's, and he was never sort of a favourite drummer of mine at all. But now when I listen to certain stuff that he did, it's quite out there and it's quite sort of, you know, very much him and what, and what he did and what he brought to the band and stuff. So, so things like that, I like sort of going back and listening to, to a, a older stuff, you know, um, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> So we got you here with Sakai today. Yeah. So really, some people don't know the whole story behind Sakai, but you actually play an old Yamaha kit and have Sakai. So is that kind of yeah, how you yeah. got link? Yeah, yeah. Sakai made, uh, basically made all the Yamaha kits over the last 50 years or so. And uh, I, I had a Yamaha 9000, which is kind of my first pro kit, um, uh, which, is, which was great. I'm still, I still got it, actually. Um, and I've been using on tour the Sakai Almighty Birch, which is basically the, a, a Yamaha 9000. Okay. Similar to the red one, which we can have a lovely video for. S yes, yes, similar to that one. Uh, that's, ma that's a maple one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So you're rocking a Birch on tour. Is that just for projection? What makes you? It's just what I, I like it sounding. I think it's got a, for the for what I, the music I'm playing. It's got a great pop sound. Uh, I just I stick some pinstripes on it. It just sounds great. I mean, you know, that's I mean, you know, real eighties. It is indeed pinstripe on Birch. <laughs> it is indeed, um, and they're just great. I mean, everybody. A lot of people who come and see the gig. They everyone's even even non musicians have gone. That kid sounds great. You know. Uh, you know, up, up to the front of house engineers that are just so wow, that kit, it's just, it's, it's, it sounds great, it's really good. So, a bit unusual for your normal gig, you've played mm. three kits today. I have, yeah. Which one was your favourite? Uh, I quite like the Maple one, which is the, the Almighty Maple. Which that is was, similar to your gig. Really. yeah, yeah. So, that's, that's kind of where I felt most comfortable. Although the Trilogy is nice as well, and I have used the Trilogy uh, recently on a, a couple of gigs. Um, it's not completely right for the kind of music I was, we were doing, but I, I do love it. It's really nice. Um, again, I preferred the trilogy with uh, the clear heads on, and I think these ones today are coated. But um, again, it's just what, you know what you what you're into. And then the um, what's the other kit called? Road anew. That was the one with the strong new. bass drum. The road anew was actually it surprised me a lot. Actually, the kick drum's lovely. It literally, it's just come out the come out the um, the box, and it sounds great. It's super punchy. Yeah, yeah, it? absolutely, yeah. Bargain as well. <laughs> <laughs>
you'll get a chart and make your own or just get yeah, a chart I like and ignore using, it? Yeah, I like, I like using my own really because, you know, it's, it's some people can be, you can be, you can be over fussy with how people write out charts and, you know, literally write down to certain fills. I mean, obviously some songs require certain fills and you can hear those on the record if it's, if it's a very well known record or, but um, no, I tend to sort of try and do my own thing really. So apart from the videos that you've done for us, which there's a few more to follow, mm -hmm. Where, where can people catch you? Uh, I've got a website, simonmerry.com. You can look at that if you desire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the usual stuff, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I'll occasionally do all, a bit of tweeting. All the socials. That's the one. There we go. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in. Hopefully you had as much fun as we did making it. It was a bit of a laugh. <laughs> um, check out the kits to come. We've got three more videos. So Simon's going to bash a few drums in different styles and things. This is Drum Addicts on Anton's TV. And we'll see you next time. Um, <laughs> Should we glance over that yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. <laughs> 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 got one of those. <laughs> 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 I think it's just. Can't go again. No, for sake. This is not going well, is it? We just started off so well. <laughs> Go from Glory Hole Bricks. Um, yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when you said you still got your 9,000, I nearly brought up your ex wife saying, Oh, she didn't get it. Now she had the Pearl Export, which I told her was worth 25 grand. <laughs> She's got it in a museum. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Question. Doing a <laughs> <laughs> Don't you Can't. Don't you Can't. 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 can I had a four men. <laughs> There's oh, not enough holes. Oh, Come on, guys, let's wait. Easy step, two, three, four, one. Rick Seeker, I think he puts up a good tile, Rick. <laughs> or does he just grout afterwards? He's a, he's a grouter. Shit. I do have Instagram. You follow me on Instagram, don't I you? I know you do. Me and two other people. <laughs> <laughs> Blue McGainer and the uh, Polish bloke who's doing my bathroom. <laughs> <laughs>